and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Monday, September 23rd, we are studying Psalm 119, verses 161 to 168. In today's text, we rejoice before God at His words and praise Him throughout the day for all that He has spoken. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Mark Squire. Pastor Squire serves at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in St. Ansgar, Iowa. Pastor Squire, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Great to be with you. Uh, We have the second to last section of Psalm 119 today, Pastor Squire. Talk to us about the Psalter and this large psalm to get us started. Yeah, the Psalter is wonderful. That's what I have to say. Every Christian should be in the Psalms all of the time. The Psalms are the worship book of the church. They're the prayer book of the church. Hopefully the congregations that your listeners attend have the Psalms in some way, shape, or form in their services, in part because it, it connects us with Christians of the past. And In part, too, because the Psalms, like every other book in the Bible, find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And we see much of the life of Jesus throughout the Psalms. But what Psalm 119 does in particular is it focuses us on God's word in general, not just his commands or his law. But this word that we see throughout this Torah word, it really does mean God's instruction, everything that he's taught, everything that he's said. And so what Psalm 119 does in this unique position here in between the uh, so-called Halal Psalms, the Hallelujah Psalms, the 113 through 118, and then you have the Songs of Ascent, 120 through 134, right smack dab in the middle, you have the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. Really just focusing our attention, whether we're singing, whether we're praying, on the Word of God, which again, brings us to the life and ministry of Jesus, but also how this life and ministry of Jesus helps us to connect with our God and Father in heaven and connect, uh, again, with our Lord Jesus. So the Psalter really is, and it's beautiful in its poetry, it's beautiful in its message. And what we see here in Psalm 119 in particular, this the poetry here comes uh, off as an acrostic. So your listeners who have been following or who know anything about poetry, acrostic is something where every line or part of a certain uh, poem begins with uh, the, the same letter, the next letter, something like that. And so here in Psalm 118, we have these groups of eight verses that begin with each successive Hebrew letter. And so here near the end, we have this letter that you'll probably see in the heading in your Bible, the sin or shin. It's the second to last letter in uh, the Hebrew alphabet. And basically, depending on where the little dot is above the letter, you either say an a s sound or a sh sound, but it's the same letter, just with a different uh, kind of aspiration. Mm. Yeah, this is the letter that's behind, is it in Judges? The Sibboleth or Shibboleth? Oh, that's right, that's right. There's yeah. that incident where they distinguish people based on whether they say it with the s sound or the sh sound. This is that right. letter, so... Where are you from and what accent do you have? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So again, the second to last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the second to last part of this uh, poem. In terms of, obviously, we're toward the very end now of this poem. Where have we been? Are there any particular themes that, that you notice in this stanza that stand out? I, I guess to connect it with everything else, of course, the focus here is on the word of God, whether you have the word Torah, Davar, meaning word, or uh, command, or instruction, all these words that end up being in some way synonymous. But you also have some other themes that we're going to see that stick out. For example, persecution, right? So God's word, as life-giving and wonderful and beautiful as it is in this life, in this sinful world, will bring God's people hardship and affliction and persecution because those who are in the world, those who hate and despise God's word, are always going to be raging against God and his word and his people. So to think back to Psalm 
II, for example, the nations rage and the kingdoms, they're all raging against the Lord and against his anointed. And so we who have been anointed through baptism and connected with our Lord Jesus Christ are going to face this same sort of persecution and affliction. But I think what we're going to see here again, too, is the opposite end. The words of joy, the words of rejoicing may call to mind for us something like Paul's letter to the Philippians, especially chapter 4, where Paul, who's writing from prison, essentially says, I've learned in whatever situation to be content, but you see this man who's in chains using this word joy over and over and over and over. And I think what we gain from Psalm 119 is a greater appreciation that God's word is not simply this, thou shalt not. But it really is the life-giving force from God, right? It's this living water that comes to us and feeds us and helps us to bear fruit. Absolutely. Yeah, this is a beautiful psalm that fills us with the joy to have God's Word in all of its fullness, using those synonyms throughout this book, the various ways of speaking about God's Word, has helped us to rejoice, and we continue to do that now in this section. This is Psalm 119, beginning at verse 161. Princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and testimonies, for all my ways are before you. That is the text for today, Psalm 119, verses 161 through 168. Talk to us about our first verse. Princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. Yeah, so first off, I mentioned that this this psalm, Psalm 119, is this an acrostic poem. And so here we are in this section of Sin and Shin. And so the first word you have here in this section is Sharim, princes. And this is a word that can mean, yes, princes or or royalty of some kind, but really any sort of leader. So this doesn't, when we start to think about how does this connect with us, for example, this doesn't just have to be those who are in sort of high government authority or something like that. It can be anyone that's in any sort of leadership position. And I think For us Christians, when we start to think, who is it that's maybe brought about this sort of affliction or uh, persecution uh, against me because of my faith, we're not necessarily going to think of kings and princes and presidents and governors and these sorts of things. Now, some of that may be true, especially depending on where you live in the world, but this can be much more local. This can be principles, this could be local officials, this can be bosses, right? The people that, for one reason or another, because of your faith, bring about persecution, what you see here is without cause, right? So this, this is, I think, a point that we need to remember because it's easy for us, maybe any time that something, somebody does something bad to us or harms us, to think, oh, I'm being persecuted. We have to step back for a second and think, did I do something wrong? Am I just being a jerk? That's, (laughs) I think, something we have to remember that not all bad things that happen to us are persecution. But as Christians, we are going to face real and true persecution without cause, simply because of what we believe. Now, this without cause, of course, is it has to find its fulfillment ultimately in Jesus Christ, right? The man who had no sin, the man who came to proclaim God's word in its fullness, the man who came to uh, preach and proclaim and enact the kingdom of God among people through his healing, through his preaching, through his forgiving of sins. Mm -hmm. And yet what happens? You have uh, many of the Jews and the Gentiles who are rejecting him simply because he's inaugurating God's kingdom. only because he's preaching exactly what God's word says to the point where he is betrayed by one of his own and sent to the cross and crucified and killed again for no reason other than they hated him. And of course, this is God's plan. That's the ultimate reason. But from a human manner of speaking, this is 
we don't like this guy and we want to get rid of him. Yeah, that, I think that phrase without cause helps us in those moments when we are being persecuted to continue to be bold when we realize it's not because of something that we have done that was wrong or sinful. As you said, it's good to examine our hearts lest we, right. we do suffer. Peter talks about that in his first epistle. Yes. You don't suffer as a murderer, don't suffer because of your sin. But if you suffer because you're a Christian, then rejoice, continue to be bold, because you know that it's not you're not being persecuted for yourself, you're being persecuted because you're connected to Christ, who is the innocent one. And, and I think it fills us with more boldness when we realize there's not a just cause for that persecution. Rather, it's because we're connected to Christ that enables us to respond to persecution, like the apostles do in the book of Acts, that they just go back out and do the same thing that got them thrown in a jail in the first place. Absolutely, which is, I'm glad you brought this up, because the second part of this verse plays directly into that, that what's our response when we're persecuted without cause? Is it to stop living according to the Word of God? Is it stop? Is it to stop preaching or teaching or whatever? It, it, no, of course not. The apostles are a prime example of this. They go back out after they've been told not to do this anymore, and they continue preaching because God told them to. Right? This is Peter and John's you know, apostles' response mm-hmm. to the council. We must fear God rather than men which is exactly what the psalmist is saying here, that I stand in awe, right? I stand in awe of your words. My heart stands in awe of your words, which this word in particular isn't simply awe, but but it is, properly speaking, fear. Mm. Now, which brings us then to the catechism, the, the explanation of all the commandments. We should fear and love God so that, right? And we always have to talk about with that, what does that mean? Are we afraid of God? Not so much in that sort of worldly sense, but yes, he is the one who can send to condemnation if we oppose him, right? But it is this reverence, this honor, this holy awe and fear. And this is the response even to persecution, that I stand in awe of God. I fear God more than I fear, Luther said, the words of God are feared more than the scourges of men. So no matter what what's happening to me, they're not going to beat it out of me. I'm going to love God's word, God's instruction more than my own life. Yeah, what you just said there about the fear of God more than the fear of men, I think is really important. It re- one of the, my favorite places to go in the scriptures to talk about the fear of God is in Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus says, don't be afraid of men. Don't be afraid of those who can only kill the body. Yes. Rather, fear the, the one who can throw both body and soul into hell. So, right. Fear God, don't fear men. But then just a couple of verses later, he reminds you that your Heavenly Father is the one who knows the number of hairs yes. on your head and cares for even the birds, so you don't need to be afraid. I love that that juxtaposition of fear God, but don't be afraid. And I think here's another good example of that. Right. Absolutely. One more thing I want to go back to in this verse that you started off with, the princes, and not just thinking about earthly rulers, but also anyone in authority. I think it's also helpful for us as Christians, especially when we see this in the Psalms, and we think about the princes or the enemies who would persecute us, it's also very helpful for us to consider our spiritual enemies in these contexts. So yes. We recently studied on Sharp Iron, and recently heard in the church here in the three-year lectionary from Ephesians 6, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the principalities, the prince of darkness. And I think that's a helpful thing to keep in mind with this verse, too. Absolutely. That's our ultimate enemy. And so we're not taking up swords and weapons to fight against earthly enemies, but against these. In Ephesians 2 as well, he uses this word, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So yeah, these powers of darkness, the devil and his minions who are ultimately behind all of this persecution. And I think what we see in our Lord Jesus, too, is that Gethsemane on the cross, he has this in mind, so much so that he can say about the people that are crucifying him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Who's actually doing this? Is it people, or is it this slithering serpent who has brought all people into temptation and evil? Yeah, yeah. So again, to keep that in mind is helpful in this verse, especially if you're in a, one, a spot where you're not necessarily feeling the persecution of princes that you can see. Certainly right. we feel the persecution of the princes we can't see. So let us fear God's word. Verse 162, I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. Talk to us about the joy that we have at the word of God. 
Yeah, again, this word joy, this word rejoicing, you, Hebrew, you have sheish, and it does, of course, imply this uh, quite the opposite of what you would feel if you're being persecuted, mm-hmm. right? And yet, like we were thinking about with the Apostle Paul, you can rejoice even in your sufferings, right? But the rejoicing here, I think what I want to talk about with this word is that it often implies singing, right? What do you do when you're especially happy? You might, you know, smile and beam, you might dance around. And I think for most people, they ha- they hum a tune or they sing, they sing a song, right? Which is what we see throughout the scriptures, don't we? All Imagine you're in a, in a musical and, and yeah. people just start breaking forth into singing. That's we should right. do that more often as Christians. <laughs> we, yeah. we should do that. People will be like, what are you doing? Let me tell you. <laughs> and here, and not to get too lost in the grammatical weeds, but this is a participle, which often implies this ongoing action. So it's not just, a, oh, I sang my song and I'm done, but this ongoing, there's a song in my heart, right? This song that comes forth from these living waters of God's word. How can I keep from singing, right? If I have God's word here and the joy that comes from that, I'm going to sing. And one reason I wanted to point this out, too, is that the Psalms, in large part, are meant to be sung. We're used to reading the Bible, and usually quietly, in our minds. We don't even read it out loud. I think, at the very least, we should be reading the Bible out loud more. But the Psalms in particular, and we do this, of course, in the Divine Service, whether it's the intro it or the Psalm of the Day or whatever, that you have an opportunity to sing or to chant these psalms. Some of our hymns are direct versifications of certain psalms. Mm -hmm. Uh, You have some wonderful Isaac Watts hymns, for example, where he's put some of the psalms to verse. And yeah, we should be singing. This is what rejoicing looks like. Absolutely. The the Christian life is one of singing. I think a, a great moment in the divine service where you see this actually happen is when the transition between the proper preface and the Sanctus in the service of the sacrament, where the pastor is given to say, therefore with angels and archangels, yeah. your glorious name, evermore praising you, and saying yeah. is the word that <laughs> the pastor is supposed to say. But then what happens at that moment, the congregation actually sings. Right. And right. that's one of those moments where there's no musical introduction. The organist just jumps right in, and you start singing, yes. even yeah. though the pastor said saying. Yeah, I, I hope the Inquisition doesn't come and find me, but I always change it to singing. I, oh. I always say singing because that's what we're doing, right? That's what we're doing. <laughs> no, no, no one's throwing a flag on that play, perhaps. After. <laughs> yeah, no one ever expects the Inquisition. Though. That's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but we do. We just we break forth into song within the divine service. That is why we sing, because of the great joy that we have at the Word of God. And there's a number of places in the Scriptures where this happens. Some of them made very explicit, for example, yes. the Apostle. Also, Paul and Silas in prison in Philippi <laughs> are singing hymns. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. It, it really is. But I think it, other places in the scriptures, especially like the Psalms, where you see poetic language, we can, I think, imagine those being sung in their original context. One, one example that I like to at least imagine is in Genesis chapter 2, where Eve is first given to Adam, and he says, mm-hmm. at last, and it's in poetry there in the Hebrew, I like to picture Adam singing that. I sure. could be wrong, but I think we would do well to to imagine at least more singing in the scriptures and then to to import that into our lives as Christians too. Yeah, and I think you're right. Every time we see this poetry, it's almost impossible not to envision singing, whether it's Moses and the people in Exodus 15, whether it's Deborah, whether it's Hannah. Throughout the Old Testament, you have Mary and Zechariah, of course, in Luke chapter 1. It's hard not to... When we're reading this, I'm singing along in my head with the liturgy for some of these songs because we sing them so often. Yeah, so sing. This is a good thing for Christians. It comes from the joy of the Word of God. Now, the reason that the rejoice or the comparison for the joy given in this verse is that we rejoice like one who finds great spoil. What's the picture here? Yeah, the spoil, this word gets at plunder, treasure, something like that, and not in the pirate sort of sense, but finding something in the field, right? Which So we have our Lord Jesus tell two parables with this sort of language. So if you go to Matthew 13, you have this parable of the treasure in the field, the, these treasures that are found. And the interesting thing about those parables is that you have, they're very short, and yet, The thing that ties them together is the treasure, and yet in one you have a man who's seeking the treasure, and in one you have a man who wasn't seeking and yet found it, right? Mm. So whether you're looking or whether you stumble upon this, 
it is a great treasure. And what's your response? You're going to go and sell everything you have because this is worth more than all of it. So here in, in, in Psalm 119, what's the treasure? It's God's word. <laughs> this is worth more than anything. And so Luther had put it this way, our every rejoicing is in the hope of things to come and not in the reality of things present. And again, this gets at this beautiful reality that our treasure is not that which is stored up on earth, that which can rust or be stolen or be destroyed, but that which is stored up in heaven with our Lord Jesus, who will come again and make all things new. You were pointing out, I think, at the beginning of this verse, the idea of the participle, I am rejoicing, or the ongoing nature. It looks yes. like we have another participle here, the one who finds, I think, if my Hebrews yes. remember, that's also a participle. And so you, it's that same idea of the ongoing activity that I am seeking these things, I'm looking for, I'm wanting to find this great spoil and see this treasure in the Word of God. Absolutely. This is ongoing finding, and I more and more convinced that we have lost this to some extent in our modern day. And the more that you read, for example, the early church fathers especially, what that, what they're going to be saying is essentially that this is a task that's never done until you die. That you are constantly searching and seeking for the sake of Christian discipline, for the sake of, Paul talks in terms of training your body, Right? So whether you're rejoicing, whether you're seeking, all of these things that are connected with God's word are driving at a sort of increase in knowledge and fear of the Lord, essentially. Not just a, oh yeah, Jesus forgives me, so I'm good. That's a twisting of the gospel, right? That's, that becomes essentially this false gospel. It's not, oh, Jesus died for me, so I don't have to worry about anything. No, Jesus died for me, so what else do I want to pay attention to other than God's word, right? He's made me his child. I want to look at my father and gaze into his eyes so that I can rejoice with my brother, our Lord Jesus Christ, in his salvation. Mm, yeah, and what a, what a joyful picture to, to seek after God's word as, the, as a, a buried treasure, uh, to, to look for it, to, to dedicate right. my life to it. You can think of some stories where, where a person spends all kinds of energy trying to find this particular treasure. You don't have to find this treasure in the sense that it's unknown to you. you just It's right there in the scriptures. Open, read, mark, learn, yeah. inwardly digest all those beautiful verbs that we, we say in the Collect for the Word. This is the life that God gives to us to seek the spoils, the riches of his word, and to find great joy. Paul says, too, that God is close enough that we can reach out and touch him, right? Where is he? He's right here in the Word. Yeah, yeah. it's a, a wonderful thing. And that's what we heard, again, not that long ago in the church here from Deuteronomy 4. What made the nation of Israel so great, according to Moses, is that God's right here, that he hears us when we pray. In this context, he's right here. He's in his Word for us that we might find the, the riches that he has for us. Right. So the next verse, 163, we can get started here before the break. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. Talk to us about the first word of that verse in Hebrew. Yeah, so the first word we have here is sheker, which means deception, disappointment, falsehood. So that word is fronted here in the Hebrew, which even in English poetry, our word order is a lot more flexible, right? Now in other languages, in general, word order is more flexible. But here especially, this is that word falsehood. Okay, so you have, you've had God's word, you've had rejoicing and all this, and now falsehood's just put right in front of you. And what is our relation to falsehood? We hate it. We abhor it. Now, we have to be careful with these ideas. And before, maybe before I get there to say more about this word falsehood, I think <clears throat> what we have here is a contrast with God's word, with this Torah, with the, the words, with the commands. Mm -hmm. Because we know that even earlier in Psalm 119 itself, twice we have the explicit idea that God's word is truth. So verse 43, verse 160, Jesus reflects this in John 17 in his great high priestly prayer, sanctify them in your truth, your word is truth. So anything contrary to God's word is by very definition a lie or a falsehood. Everything that goes against it, anything that contradicts it, anything that tries to twist it or whatever. This is all falsehood. And when we think about what should be our reaction to that, we hate it. We abhor it. 
And not that we're like angrily running around setting things on fire or destroying things. Not that sort of hatred, how we use that word today, but that we're in this sort of adversarial relationship with that there is some clear delineation that this is not of me. I don't want this to be what I'm seeking after. I don't want this to be who I am because I have something better in God's word. Absolutely. And that's where the second half of this verse takes us, that we love that word. We'll pick that up on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor Mark Squire this morning. We will be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that an investment with Lutheran Church Extension Fund exclusively supports LCMS ministries and church workers? That's right. LCEF ensures LCMS churches, schools, and organizations have access to the financial resources they need to sustain, strengthen, and start ministry work. In other words, you can feel good investing with LCEF because we share your Lutheran values and love for the church. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Monday, September 23rd. We are studying Psalm 119, verses 161 to 168 with Pastor Mark Squire. He serves at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in St. Ansgar, Iowa. Pastor Squire, prior to the break, we were looking at verse 163 about hating and abhorring falsehood, not so much the emotional response and the violence, but the I'm a complete adversary. The, the way that I've described it previously is it's what we do in the baptismal when we renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways. We want absolutely nothing to do with falsehood. On the flip side, the opposite is I love your law, your Torah. Talk to us about the love that we have for God's yeah. law. Yeah, you're right. I think that's a great place to go because it shows us that this is about allegiance. Who do you serve? And this is what Moses says before his death. This is what Joshua reiterates so many times. Who are you going to serve? Back in Deuteronomy, again, you have this, I have set before you good and evil, right? Choose the good. Right. So to hate, to abhor is to say, I pledge allegiance to God and to nothing else. So I will say, too, again, with this sort of repetition, Hebrew poetry is great at this, this intensifier. I hate, I abhor your law, right? And yet, now what do I do? I love God's law. So I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. And so this love, then, again, is not a feeling. It's not the wonderful response I get when I see the person I have a crush on, that sort of thing. But it's, it is, again, it's a relationship. It's an ongoing commitment. It's something where, again, to go back to the last verse, we're continuing to rejoice, continuing to find. And so I think this can be summed up in, when we see the Lord Jesus sum this up too in the Gospels, that what is essentially, what are essentially the two things that we are called to do? We're called to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. What does this mean? It means this, I'm living like what God has created me to do. I'm living within my vocations, which means I fear, love, and trust in God above all things, and I do good to my neighbor. So here, when I love God's law, what I'm doing is I'm showing allegiance to him. I am renouncing the devil, the world, my sinful nature, all of the things that that are going to tear me away from this or lead me astray. Mm-hmm. Moving into verse 164, seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules. The word seven is also the first word in Hebrew in this verse. Correct, Shabba. So you have the number seven, and probably do a lot of different things with this, but really I think what we see throughout the scriptures is that seven is in general a number of completeness. So right from the very beginning of the scriptures in creation, God sets this structure this order to creation with the number seven. There are seven days in the week. You have six days where God created, one day where he rests. 
And in that resting, in that stopping from creation and setting that day apart as holy, everything is now not just good, but very good, right? So we have this number of completeness. And so even in a day, we can think about what does it mean to completely love God's law? What does it mean to Mm. praise God for his righteous rule? So we have to be careful not to take this literally because of the context here. This is poetry. This is all of the things, right? But what we do see, of course, throughout history that that there are times of day where God's people have set aside time to come before the Lord in prayer, to come before the Lord in this rejoicing, in this finding, in this seeking. And for example, in Daniel chapter 6, we see that Daniel, several times a day, he comes up to his room and he sets his face to Jerusalem and he prays. In the same way that Peter in Acts 10, at the time of prayer, he goes up to the roof to pray and then what happens? He falls into a trance, right? But even throughout history, like the monks, for example, have taken passages like this and they've set this out in a structure So that seven times a day, they actually do come together for Mm -hmm. the daily offices and orders. So you have matins, you have vespers, you have compline, all these sorts of things. So we don't necessarily have to say, okay, what's this, what, what time, what seven times during the day do I have to do this? But it would be good for us to set aside (laughs) times during the day to say, I am going to, barring emergency, do nothing during this five, 10, 15 minutes, however long you want to make it. I'm going to do nothing except be in the word and prayer. Yeah, I, I would. I think the the force of this verse, seven times a day I praise you, ends up being very similar to the way St. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, pray without ceasing. Yeah. There's no time that's out of bounds for prayer. This is the constant habit of Christians. Having said that, what you are saying is, is very good wisdom, and I, I've often taught it like this, that we should pray without ceasing. We should pray frequently, but we should pray regularly. There should be those regular times of prayer so that we develop those good habits. This is our sanctification before God to train ourselves, to discipline ourselves, as you said earlier. So yes, anytime, always pray for sure. Right. Seven times. Set aside those regular times to train yourself for this good gift of God. And I think we see this even in worldly ways. So I think people can understand this even from their own experiences in, say, marriage, for example, right? Oh, I don't want to set aside a time each week to have a date with my spouse because then it won't be romantic and spontaneous. And But you quickly see that these sorts of things, when it can be any time, it ends up being no time, yep. right? So part of maturing in any relationship is being able to say, I am going to make this a priority by setting aside time to do it, how much more than for God's word and rejoicing in it, that we can say at nine o'clock, I'm going to be in God's word and I'm going to pray. And oh, that might not seem like I'm being very on fire for God or some sort of thing, but you're seeking after God's word. What can be better? That's right. So do that regularly, often, seven times a day, however often the Lord gives you to rejoice. In that word for rejoicing here or praising God, I think once again invites the thought of singing, which we talked about earlier. Particularly, we praise God for his righteous rules. Now, we've talked a little bit about this particular turn of phrase in Hebrew, but it's worth digging into again, because righteous rules... I think in this context, and in many contexts, doesn't quite do justice to what's being talked about here. Ah, look at the pun there. It doesn't do justice to it. Yes, (laughs) these are the words in Hebrew. So you have mishpat and zedekah, so justice and righteousness, which over and over, especially in the Old Testament, come about as these ideas, these realities that the Lord is seeking after. And so here, literally in the Hebrew, it reads, for the judgments of your righteousness. So this is everything that God seeks in his Torah, which is to say, we're praising God for the completeness of what he brings about, which we're going to see then in the next verse as well. What does this completeness look like? But this is more than just rules. Like when we hear rules, we think of the do this, don't do this. But the judgments of God in answering prayer, which is to say, God hears our prayer And he does what is right, what is good, what is according to his will. 
which then, of course, as we see God do this throughout history and in our own lives, these are the things that we want to bring about as well in our actions and words. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's fuller than just rules. It's God's bringing about that which is right and good. Yeah, and so this is why we praise God for these righteous judgments of his righteousness. We praise him for that. Both law and gospel are included in that, that term, I'm convinced. So we praise him regularly as we seek after the spoils of his word. The next verse says, Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. The first word of this verse is probably familiar to many Christians. Yeah, you have the word shalom, which is a word that we've probably heard even among English speakers, but it's a word that's still used among modern-day Jews. And most literally, this means peace, or this is usually how it's used, but really this gets at a sort of wholeness, right? When things are at peace, they're good. To get us back to Genesis 1 almost, right? That there is, everything's working like it should. And so you have this intensifier, this great peace Right? So for those who love the Lord's Torah, you have, you have not just peace, but great peace. To go back to Philippians 4, Paul can be content. He can be at peace because he's seeking after God's word, even when he's in chains. So this is what it looks like to love Yahweh with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, is to love the Lord's Torah, his instruction, his word. Because again, we find... God's will there, we find we find wholeness there. We find what we need. Yeah, the, the great peace, that's the same modifier as before the great spoil that we find in the, the Word of God. This is what God gives to those who love his Torah. And then a, a beautiful promise in the, the second part of the verse, nothing can make them stumble. Right, which again, we have to be careful with because some people can take this and twist it and make it into this sort of worldly idea that nothing bad will happen to me, right? If I just have enough faith, if I just pray the right way, then things are going to be good. And obviously, even in this context, we see that's not the case, right? Princes are persecuting me without cause. Why? Because I love God's word. So if I'm seeking after that, which is good, bad things will still happen. So what we have to do is focus on this word stumble, which this word in Hebrew can mean offense or stumbling block. This sort of language that, of course, as Christians, we're probably most familiar with from the Gospels when our Lord Jesus Christ references the Psalms and the prophets. But also Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 when he's talking about preaching Christ and him crucified. Christ crucified, Paul says, is a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. So this idea of being afflicted or persecuted simply for being a, a child of God, people can look at this in the world and say, why in the world would you endure this for something that doesn't even seem real? Right? It becomes a stumbling block. This savior of ours who was killed naked on a cross, right? we can very easily, I think, get from here to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, which is a stumbling block to the world. And yet for us, we don't stumble, which is a theme that we see throughout the scriptures, all the way back in Psalm 1, right? Uh, they cannot be moved, right? Or, Pastor Apple, you were talking about Ephesians 6 before. Mm. In the first few verses of that pericope, in verses, what, 10 through 12 or something like that, over and over, Paul says, so that you can stand, withstand, so that you can stand, right? Because stumbling is implying that we're not continuing on the way. And if we stumble long enough, we're falling away. So there's this sense that continuing God's word, again, this sort of ongoing action, we're going to be able to stand, we're going to be able to walk, we're going to be able to withstand this persecution. Yeah, and that all comes about through the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, connecting it to Ephesians 6, in which we stand because we've been clothed with that full armor of God, baptized into Christ. I think another similar phrase to this one from Psalm 119, if, if your church happens to celebrate St. Michael and all angels coming up at the end of September, you might hear from Luke chapter 10 as the gospel reading, in, in which Jesus makes a very similar promise. He, he says this in Luke 10, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Not, nothing shall hurt you. 
No, nothing's going to make you stumble. But then he does temper that, or at least he redirects any pride that we might have. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Mm-hmm. Uh, so certainly the, the, the promise that's given here, we don't want to take in the, in the wrong way, but we do want to rejoice in this full peace, the great spoil that we do have in the Word of God that does enable us to stand in the midst of this world and its persecutions of us. Absolutely. And it's similar to the end, the longer ending of Mark there, Mark 16, where Jesus is talking about them drinking poison or being bitten by serpents. And so you have some people say, oh, I have to handle snakes so that they can bite me and I can show my faith. They're like, no, that's not no, what Jesus no. is getting at. No. So yeah, it becomes a matter of not seeking after these things. These things are going to come after you, these afflictions, right. but instead rejoice in God's word. Yeah. And, and standing, as you said, in the cross of Christ, which yes. would be a stumbling block to others, but for us, that is the power and wisdom of, of God's salvation of us. Uh, moving then into the next verse of the text, Verse 166, I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and I do your commandments. Talk to us about the Christian hope that we have. Yeah, so here the first line for the acrostic is savar in Hebrew, this word for hope. This can also mean examine or wait for. And I like this digging into this idea because for us, a lot of times it's the the easy, lazy way for us to think of faith as, as just a kind of knowledge, right? I know, I understand that. Jesus died for the sins of the world or something like that. And James does a masterful job of this in his letter, that even the demons know this and shudder, right? This becomes a matter of that this is for me, right? And if this is for me, if I hope in this truth for me as a Christian, I am examining, I am waiting for, right? There's this active sense again to the point where the Berean Christians, for example, are the ones who are searching out what they hear from Paul in the scriptures. So there's this active sense to faith, right? And we as Lutherans confess, this is all over our Lutheran confessions, and yet we sometimes forget this, that Mm -hmm. faith acts out in love, it acts out in seeking, it acts out in waiting for. So it's not an idle knowledge, but an active searching, a hoping, a praying for what God has promised in his word, which is salvation through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Now that hope in verse 166 is found in the salvation of the Lord, which is maybe a phrase we're so common to hearing that we just run over it without thinking about it. We do, and we do ourselves a disservice for that. And you see the beauty of this in Hebrew because you have, and I'll just read it in Hebrew, Yoshua Yahweh, right? What? <laughs> this takes us right to the name of our Lord Jesus. Jesus' name is Yahoshua in Hebrew, which is Yahweh saves. Okay. So when we see the salvation of the Lord in the Old Testament, this is our Lord Jesus Christ who comes. Okay. So for us as Christians, we can look and say, even in the Old Testament, those who were saved were looking forward to what God has promised. Now, we get to do both. We get to look back and we get to look forward. So as Christians, we're in this position where we can look back and see what has happened in Christ. But we are still looking forward to, we are awaiting, we are searching for and examining that which our Lord Jesus has promised for us in the future, which is, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Mm. Now, out of that, I do your commandments. Talk about the last phrase of that verse. Yeah, again, the, the, what does faith do? It drives us to do what God says. So we can't just throw up our hands and say, oh, this is impossible. I can't do it, so I'm not going to do it. No, the, the joy that springs from the hope within us is the joy that loves God. It's the joy that loves our neighbor. And of course, Yes, we're going, to, we're going to mess up sometimes, right? That's the time to hear again the forgiveness of sins that comes in Jesus. But we can't allow our sinful flesh to twist that into a lazy proclamation of what is sometimes referred to as cheap grace. We're forgiven so we don't have to pay attention to God's word. By no means! I want to do what God says. I'm going to do your commandments, not just the Ten Commandments, but what God says. Listen to what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. Listen to what the apostles are teaching. What does it look like to do God's word? To go back to what you were saying earlier from 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Sums this up. 
Yeah. All right. We've got about seven minutes here, Pastor Squire. So I'm going to take us into the last two verses because we have the same verb in both of them. So 167 and 168, my soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and testimonies for all my ways are before you. Talk to us about the keeping in these verses. Yeah, so the Hebrew verb shamar, it, it starts in, in different forms here, starts off both of these verses. And this word does mean keep. And we should think about this word a little bit because sometimes, again, our lazy sinful flesh wants us to think that, oh, I've heard it and I'm going to store it away or something. Instead of guarding and protecting these active connotations of, yes, I've heard, but how, I'm, how am I going to keep this in an active way? right? Guarding is not just putting something away under lock and key and not thinking about it. To the, maybe a, a good example of this would be Jesus' parable about the talents, right? So some, one, one person is given 10, one five, one two or one, or because there's different parables with different numbers, but the one at the end who just takes what he has and buries it until the master comes back, this is the wicked and slothful servant, right? So keeping is more than just locking away. It's this guarding, it's this protecting. But what are we keeping? The testimonies, the precepts. Again, these this repetition of synonyms to get at all of these different ways we can think about God's law, God's instruction. And this we find again this word love, right? I love them exceedingly. This active sense of seeking after that which is God's. Which stands in contrast then to the hating, the abhorring of the falsehood, right? I hate, I abhor falsehood. Now I love your testimonies exceedingly. We should also pay attention to this word, my soul, which is fronted in the English, at least. This word nefesh in in Hebrew is more than just this sort of Western idea of the soul as opposed to the body, but really the entire life of the person. So everything that I am is fighting still against the sinful flesh and against uh, the evil one and against the world. So you think of Paul in Romans 7 and 8. The sp- we say it pithily that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is mm. the sum of Paul's argument, but it's not just the soul and body type thing. It's really more of my sinful nature, which is fighting against this new nature that God has given to me. But I think maybe perhaps lastly here in, in Psalm uh 119 verse 168, all my ways are before you. This word Derek here, this word way that we see back in Psalm 1, this this psalm that kicks off everything for us in the Psalter, that we don't stand in the way of sinners, right? There really are only two ways. There's the wide way to destruction, which Jesus talks about, or there's the narrow way to salvation, which is the way of Christ. It's the way of the church, the way of God's word. Mm, yeah, and the idea of the way was prominent in this psalm in a number of places, including the very first w- verse, blessed are those whose way is blameless. Yes. Yeah. Here, I think my ways is a, a reminder, as we've seen in this psalm, that as the Lord puts forth his way and puts us in his way, that shapes our ways as well. So I mean, our ways are being molded to the way who is our Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly. So when we see my ways, it's not the ways that I've come up with. It's not the ways that I own, but it's the ways that have been made mine, the ways that I walk because God has put me on this path. So because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and I walk in him, it is also my way, right? But it's, I, I don't own it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's been shaped by this word of God that I love, that has been placed in my heart, that I'm finding these riches there. That's how my ways are being shaped. With about three minutes here, Pastor Squire, help us to to make connections to to Christ, our life in in Him, and, and help us to wrap things up this morning. Yeah, so as always, we always we find the fulfillment of all of this in Jesus Christ. So when we think about this psalm, or any of the psalms in particular, as being the prayer book of God's people They are so because they are the prayers of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only one who was ever persecuted completely without cause, who completely hates and abhors falsehood, and who perfectly loves God's word and finds peace and hope in it. Again, you think of Jesus who has emptied himself of everything that belongs to him, and yet even from the cross, in the garden and from the cross, can look to his Father in hope that he can commend his spirit to his Father, knowing that God will raise him from the dead 
and all righteous and justiceness will flow from poetically his pure side, right? So we who are then connected to Jesus Christ in this, we should resist this sort of overly simplistic kind of twisted law gospel lens of, I can't do it, Jesus did it for me type of thing. Instead, what we should be doing is looking to God's word, God's instruction as the source of life. In that, Paul says in Romans 8, that because of Christ, we have nothing to fear because nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So we can stand in awe of this message. We can stand in awe of God's word. We can truly fear, love, and trust in God because we are in Jesus Christ. Apart from him, apart from God's word, we have nothing. We are nothing. But instead, in God's word, we're placed by these streams of living water all that we do prospers, even if it doesn't seem like it at the time. Because, again, the way of the wicked leads to death, but the way of Christ, the way of God's word, is a spring which flows unto eternal life and a new creation. Pastor Mark Squire serves at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in St. Ansgar, Iowa. He has been helping us today to study Psalm 119, verses 161 to 168. Pastor Squire, thanks for being our guest today. You're very welcome. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about this section of Psalm 119, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Join us again tomorrow as we wrap up Psalm 119 with the last eight verses, and then stay tuned later this week. On Wednesday, we are beginning a series on the book of numbers to talk about that fantastic book, how the Lord was faithful to his people, even in their unfaithfulness in the wilderness. Thanks for spending the morning with us today. Talk with you again tomorrow. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.